Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Fishing for Men with Mac show. Hello, everybody. It is, as always, super cool to have you on the show. And I, I thank you for for signing in and, and listening to this. And I must say, uh, I find it interesting that you did sign in because this isn't one of the most exciting topics to talk about. And uh, this podcast is entitled, We Are Going to Die. Most people, they don't want to talk about death. But it seems like death, the idea of death is like sort of hanging in the air with this coronavirus story. People are extremely frightened of this disease. And maybe it's just because people don't want to get sick or it's because people are extremely scared of dying. So this this thing called death, that is an ultimate reality. It's something that we cannot escape um, and yet, that is the thing that l- most people don't talk about. That's the least spoken about phenomena that we as human beings experience. And so I thought about giving that a shot. And l- let me just say before I continue, I would really like some uh, feedback. If you've got any feedback or questions that you would like to uh, me to address on the show, or you'd like to be part of the show, you'd like to give a, a talk on the show, I'd like to include people as much as we can and have uh, great um, discussions. If you've got anything on your mind, please don't hesitate to send me a message. You can go look for me on Facebook or you can, if you've got my number, just send me some messages. Um, any questions you might have would be really, really awesome. And just to remind you, this podcast can be found on YouTube. Uh, it's on Spotify and on iTunes. So you don't have to download any Podbean app, etc. You can just go and go Go listen to it on YouTube. I think that's the easiest. So, how did I get into this topic for this week? Uh, I got a call on Wednesday night from an individual uh, that was at a funeral that I did a few months ago. And he said to me that uh, his uncle had passed away and he wanted the funeral to be quite special. And he he searched me up, found my number, and he he asked me if I could come do the, the funeral the next day. That was now on Thursday. And... I said, obviously, yes, that's that's great. That that won't be a problem because I really like talking about Christ, talking about life, talking about purpose, and I will be there to encourage people. And I, I arrived there at this uh, funeral place. It's uh, by a cemetery, and it was quite an interesting experience because I walked around. I looked at the dates. There were people there that were born in the 1800s and 1700s on the on the graves you could read the dates that they were born and the dates that they died and it was just phenomenally interesting people you know people came from all over the world they came to South Africa and they they built a life here lived here for like 70 years and then they died here um, it was a wonderful time it must have been for them to explore this beautiful country and then I looked up to this little hall where uh, we're going to have this memorial service and it had a chin, chimney. So it had a chimney on the one side and the other side it had a sort of a, a, a tower like building on top and on top of it was a tree growing. It was like amazing. And I thought, how in, how how did that tree get up on top of that building? Because there's no soil there, but this tree is growing out of the, the bricks and stuff. And then I saw the smoke coming out of the chimney. It's just such an interesting place for me to be and I wondered well what smoke is coming out of there this is a this is this is a little chapel thingy why is there smoke is somebody making a fire and then I went inside to this um, little memorial service room and there were just these 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 um, stone tablets all around the walls hundreds and hundreds of people that have been that have had funerals in that little place and inside of this chapel there was a a coffin and that was the person that is deceased and then I saw behind this coffin there were two little doors that that could open up and I asked the undertaker what is that and he said no after the service then we just push the coffin straight through and it gets and the person gets cremated and that was a first for me that I'm actually in the same building right now this person's body is going to be burnt now this person is going to be ashes within the next hour what an experience and just being there you know obviously I'm it's a bit to be honest with you it's a bit freaky I didn't feel so comfortable and you look at all these plaques on the walls hundreds of people that have died and whose ashes are in this building and here's a person that recently died and he's going to turn into ashes just now and just the reality the reality of death just sunk in again It's one of those places where you don't want to be. I mean, who would like to be there? And in that moment, experiencing that, looking at these lines between the dates, 
you know, born on this day um, and then died on that day. And that space between the one date and the other date of every person who's represented on that wall. I mean, every little line there tells a story. If every person that 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 was buried in that cemetery could come during that funeral service and come talk to us and say to us how we need to live our lives. What would they say? What would they say? So I, I planned to talk about something else on the podcast this week, but I thought that experience sort of pushed me to say, man, let me talk about this. Let me let me share this uh, with everybody on the show, because I think it is extremely important. Over the years, I've uh, had the opportunity to do hundreds of funerals. It's things that I don't shy away from. And I knew a lady who worked at a funeral parlor and she used to get a lot of people in who are religious but they don't go to church, for example, or, or they're not religious, but they do believe in God, or, or they've got a, a confusion of uh, f- faith issues in their minds. But nevertheless, somebody died, and now they want somebody to officiate, somebody that's um, going to be willing to to encourage them and to build them up, etc., etc. And so she would phone me. And let me tell you this: after so many funerals, listening to what people say when others have died, um, talking to people who are mourning. It has really changed my life and I'm forever grateful for that, even though it might sound strange because I've really learned to value life and to value the people around me. And what I really find interesting is that most people, they say they want a minister. And so they expect this old Bali with gray hair uh, to arrive in a suit born in, uh, you know, bought in 1980. Uh, with a with a boop and a white collar and they're expecting to talk for 30 minutes about hell and damnation and suffering and you know most people tell me before and please just don't be too heavy on the theology man there's just don't don't preach everybody into hell and i'm like no you don't have to worry about that i'm here to to build you up and to um, encourage you as you live the rest of your life and most people there actually come to the funeral to say goodbye to the person that have passed away. And I'm I'm of the idea that and the opinion that it's not really about that person. I'm there because you're alive and I want to encourage you for the rest of your life to really think about how you live life. So that's why that's why I do it. And sometimes when somebody has passed away, that's probably the best time to, to ask people, listen, are you are you living life to the best of your ability? Are you responsible for your life? And what's really challenging about giving a talk at a funeral like this is, number one, you cannot lie. Well, I can't lie. Uh, I'm not going to stand there and say, look, this was the greatest man that ever lived and he's, he's lying in the arms of Jesus now. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work. Um, you know, this guy was, lived the most horrible life. Um, he um, denied God. He um, abused his children. And now we want to say that he's gone to heaven. Well, I can't say that. I'm not going to stand there and lie. So how do you avoid that? And the other thing is as well is um, you cannot deny Jesus. So I can't lie and I cannot deny Jesus. And it's not the place to preach people into hell. Um, that That's what we call dumb fishing. I'm not going to fish somebody into and say, Jesus is attractive. He wants to send you to hell. Um, that's also not going to be the best way to do it. So over time, I've had to learn how to tweak this talk that I give. And over and over, I've, I've, I've seen one way of doing it that seems to work with people who are lost. And since we're talking about this is a Fishing for Men podcast, um, I thought it would be valuable to share with you because you know what? Someone close to you might die not too long from now. Somebody might have recently died and you don't know how to comfort that person. And I hope that this will help you to give to get perspective. And another reason why I think it's important to talk about this is because you're going to die. In actual fact, we're all going to die. And everyone can benefit by thinking of death. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book written by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a very good book to read. It's one of those that you've got to have on your shelf and, and go read. And there's a second habit that he says effective people have in their lives. And this is it. They start with the end in mind. He starts that chapter by saying that you are at a funeral and you see in front of the church or the chapel, there's a coffin lying there and you walk down the aisle. And as you get to the coffin, you look around and you see all of the people that you've known in your life sitting there and they're all looking at you and you look in the, into the coffin and guess who's lying there. It's you. 
It's you lying in the coffin. And then you look at the people and he says that you need to ask yourself the question, what would you like people to say about you on your funeral day? And he says, what would you like at the end of your life to have achieved with the time that you've been given and the talents that you've been given? And he says, that's how you need to live your life. You always need to live your life in such a way, keeping in mind the end that you are going to die. How would you like the story of your life to live out? So as I was standing in the chapel, these people's stories have come to an end. But mine was not ended yet. And the people sitting there, theirs have not ended yet. We're still busy writing our stories. So I think it's a good idea to talk about the end today. So what I usually do is I try to find a text in the Bible that does not um, push people immediately away in regard to what I'm going to say about death. And I found the best way to do that is to tell them the story about this great king who lived 3,000 years ago. One night, God appeared to him in a dream and said to him, you can ask me for anything that you want and I will give it to you. Can you imagine somebody asks you that? What would you say? Money? A new house? New husband? Uh, Health? Um, You know what this king asked for? He said, He said, Lord, just give me wisdom. Just give me wisdom. And God is so happy about this, it seems like, that he says, you know, he says to to, to the king, you know, I find it so interesting that you did not ask for the destruction of your enemies, uh, for wealth, for a great name, um, but that you ask for wisdom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you wisdom and I'm going to destroy your enemies. I'm going to give you a long life and I'm going to give you extreme wealth. And so God makes these promises to him. And, you know, What's interesting is that when you've got wisdom, then you've got all the other things. Because wisdom is the skill of life. It's the ability to do life well. If you've got the skill of soccer, you can play soccer well. If you've got wisdom, then you've got the ability to do life well. And each one of us, we can sit back now and we can look at our own lives and we can basically see whether we've been living life well or not. I think it's something that we all need to pray for. Wisdom, the ability to do life well. And so this king then went on his, um, on his journey with this wisdom that God had given him. And he spent 40 years using that wisdom to try and figure out what is worthwhile to do with life on earth. And after the 40 years, after he explored wealth, after he acquired so many different things. I mean, he had horses that nobody else had, ships that nobody else had. Business ideas that nobody else had. He built palaces. He had farms. He had a thousand Woman by his side. I mean, you need tremendous wisdom to juggle 1,000 women. Uh, He had wealth that nobody else had. He had servants that nobody else had. He had just everything you can imagine. In actual fact, he said that everything he saw and he wanted it, he took it. And then he tested it with his wisdom and asked the question, is it worthwhile? Is Is it cool? Is it not? And so after the 40 years, he then wrote a book. He wrote it down. And that's the cool thing about wise people is they write down what they think. And you can, you would, you can imagine that you can go ask this guy anything. You can ask him about politics. He'll give you good advice. You can ask him about relationships. He'd be able to give you good advice. I mean, he, he was extremely wise. So this book that he wrote down is about 12 chapters. We find it in the Bible. It's the book's name is Ecclesiastes. And imagine we could have a conversation with him about death. What would he say? Would you want that king to sit next to you and tell you about death? With his wisdom, with his life experience, what would he say about this thing called death? And the cool thing about wise people is that they write down their thoughts. So I'm going to read to you what he wrote down 3,000 years ago about death. I want you to just listen up quickly. He says the following. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Now, I find that extremely, extremely interesting. And most people I, I read that to, they, they're also a little bit blown away. Because there are three things here that doesn't seem to sit that well with us. Three paradoxes that he mentions here that I'm, I'm not 
quite sure about. Let me let me reveal them to you if you didn't catch them in the text. First of all, he says the day of death is better than the day of birth. Okay, keep that in your mind. The second thing that he says is he says it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. And thirdly, he says, uh, he says, a sad face is better than a happy face. And I don't know how that sits with you, but let's tap into this just for a moment. Because I think you, if, if you hear this for the first time, you probably think the same thing as I did for the first time. Goodness, this guy can't be very wise. This doesn't make sense. Let's talk about it for a moment. Let's look at the first, the first sort of contradiction is what we, what we would think is accurate. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Now, one would assume that the day that you are born is better than the day that you die, right? Because when you die, everybody's crying, everybody's mourning, everybody is sad. But when you are born, everybody's happy. I mean, I remember when I, when my little boy was born, they say the nurses, they, they watch the father, not the mother. They watch the father. They say the, the greatest face in the world is a father when he holds his child for the first time, when he sees the birthing process. I mean, he's just 10 foot tall tall and bulletproof and his chest wants to explode he's so proud of his kid and you know what and you know these hospitals where they've got this little curtain the, the grandmas they, they can't come in into the maternity ward and so there's this little curtain in the in the hallway that you that you open and then there's a glass window and then granny's on the other side she's jumping up and down she can't wait to all this to see this baby it's, it's her first grandchild it's wonderful when a kid gets born into the world. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's happy. It's wonderful. The nurses are happy. The dad's happy. It's a wonderful occasion. I cannot imagine why the day that that person that was just born dies, why that would be a better day. And so I had to go think about this. And this is just my theory because, you know, uh, this King Solomon, he doesn't give us the answer to that question and give us the reason why he's saying that. But here's how I make sense of it. When I held my baby boys in my arms, I could look at their little faces and, you know, they didn't have a concern in the world. I mean, they had mommy there, they had their food, uh, they were clean. I mean, Micah didn't have a zit on his face. He didn't know what pain was and struggle and, and suffering. But soon he would. Soon he would have his first injection and he would cry for the first time. He'd probably fall a few times on his head as I did when I was a kid and he's going to cry about that. And after that, age six or seven, he's going to probably break an arm or a leg. Hopefully not. Um, he's going to have toothache and the tooth is going to have to be pulled. That's going to be painful. He's going to cry. He's going to cry because of the hidings that I'm going to give him. And then he's going to have vaccine injections again and he's going to cry. And then he's going to get to high school and girls are going to break his heart. And... Maybe after that, he's going to get sick a few times like I've had and been in my life. And then he's going to grow up. And he's going to become an adult. One day he's going to sit there when I die. That's going to hurt him. Um, he's going to have to work hard. He's going to have to study hard. He's going to have to struggle with ESCOM. He's going to have to make ends meet. He's possibly going to go through very difficult times. He might even live through World War Three. He might eventually develop diabetes or cancer or lose a leg in a car accident. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to point out what life is all about. And if you're listening to this and you've got gray hair, then you will know that life on earth is not always that easy. It's not that simple. My parents... My grandparents, they're taking lots of medication. They've got bodies that are paining. They've been through really hard struggles in this life. Some of them have been hit by cars. Some of them have had cancer. My grandma's had cancer twice. You're talking about wrestling with life, ladies and gentlemen. Life on planet Earth is not always easy. We fight to stay alive. But here's the thing. A baby that is born into the world still has to face all the struggles and the trials of life. They still have to face all the pain, all the irritations, all the hard work, all the climbing that ladder. But a person who dies is done. It's over. The journey is gone. No more pain. No more injections. No more hospitals. At least the pain of this earth is done. Now, if you're an unbeliever, you are into the hands of, of God's just ruling. And I don't want to say anything about that, but let's just talk about life. At the end of your life, you say goodbye to hospitals and pain and disease and struggle 
and running off the money and waking up early in the morning, going to bed late at night. It's over. It's time to rest. For the Christian, obviously, the day of death is even far better because not only is it done with this body of lust and flesh, this body that wants to drop us, this body that wants to um, move us away from God, it's not only done with this earth and its struggles, but it's the start of the new eternal life. And so death is something that we can look forward to. And if you're listening to this and you're not tired yet, you're not irritated with life yet, it means that you need to enjoy it to the best of your ability with every moment that you have. And that actually brings us into the second point that he says. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. He's saying it's better to go to a funeral than to go to a pub and go have a beer. Or to go to a birthday party. It's better to go to a funeral. And you know, on, on, on Thursday when I went to that funeral, I was thinking to myself, who would want to be here? Well, I wouldn't want to be here. That's the smell. There's a crematorium at the back. Somebody's body is busy burning. I mean, and everywhere you look, it's just death. Who wants to be here? Really? I mean, who goes into a pub and says to the guy next to him, hey, bro, let's talk about death. Nobody does that. So when do you actually think about it? Well, you think about it at funerals. And that's what Solomon says because he gives us an answer. He says, for death is the destiny of every man. And the living should take this to heart. In other words, he's saying, if you're alive, you need to place it in your heart that you will die. That it is your destiny. And we generally avoid that. That's why we don't talk about it at parties or when we have brides. Nobody wants to really talk about it. But when you go to a funeral, you cannot deny it. Because you are there because somebody has died. It's real. You can't deny it. You can't remove it from your brain or from your experience. It's there. So you have to face it. So Solomon says it's good to go to a funeral. It makes you reflect um, effectively and powerfully on life. Because if you think about death, you have to think about, about life. Now, you can look at your hand right now, and let me guarantee you this, within 100 years from now, unless you've got some serious Baraka, you, that hand of yours is going to be dust in the ground somewhere. Within 100 years from now, we will all be dead. That is, that is the harsh reality of life. And Solomon says, that's why it's good for you to be at a funeral. It's good for you to reflect on death. So what do we say about that? If it's true that we're going to die, I'd just like to say three things. First of all, you got to love the people in your life and you've got to love them well. you got to love them well because they're not always going to be there. You know, one day I was sitting with Alfreda. We were busy watching television and I've just gone through some of these funeral ex uh, experiences. And you know how it goes when you're married. Sometimes it gets a little bit heated and uh, you know that you're not welcome next to your wife anymore. So I, I moved over and I went and sat on another couch and we're still watching TV. And while I was sitting there, I think I did a funeral the previous day and I spoke about these things and I, I thought to myself, if I have five minutes left with my wife, what am I going to do right now? If in five minutes from now she dies or I die, what am I going to do with these last five minutes? Am I going to continue sitting here being upset with her? What am I going to do? And so I stood up and I went and I sat next to her and she didn't want me there. And she still didn't want me there. It was still an uncomfortable position to be in, but I put my arm around her and I just kissed her and I kissed her and I kissed her. She thought I'm weird. But I thought to myself, you know what? I want to spend every minute with you as if it is the last minute that I have with you. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so, pe so many people in this world that are upset with uncles and aunts and mothers and fathers. We don't have time to be negative. We don't have time for conflict with the people that we love. They might not be there tomorrow. We've got to a serious responsibility to stay connected with the people that we love because they will not be there forever. They say the three most difficult things for people to say is, I am wrong, I am sorry, I love you. I am wrong, I am sorry, I love you. I want to read you just a, a quick article written by a lady who is apparently a, a person who lives in Canada and serves naked and she wrote the following she says I will not wait to die to begin to live she says why must we wait to really really live until we have a waltz with sickness or death why must we wait to all the sunshine gratefully on our cheeks breathe the fresh city air only after spending 72 hours in ICU holding the hands of one we love why must we wait till we've passed an accident and seen someone on their knees beside one who no longer knows life to snap into our lives and start living and loving like we mean it? 
Why must it only sink in when we are feeding our parents water and coffee through a straw as they lay recovering in hospital beds? We are all going to die. I'm going to die. My grandparents are old and will die. My parents are going to die. My dog will eventually die. My friends will die too. So why do we wait? Why must we have to sit in an elevator that tastes like metal and hand sanitizer before we are pushed to exist deeper? Why must we wait to have an injury before we are grateful for our limbs that take us from our beds and through our days? Why must we wait till a man in a white coat with purple bags under his eyes from 16-hour shifts tells us that if we don't change, our diet will kill us? Why must we wait till we are walking with through white and blue tiled hospital wings beside yellow artwork, pretending to be cheerful, staring wishfully at fresh air through a window with a view before we start doing what we love and telling people how much they matter? Why do we work jobs we don't love? What are you doing right now? Go outside, go. Go stand in the sunshine and smile at someone. See the people around you. See the pink flowers that hang heavy, the red poppies that reach for the heavens. Feel the air in your lungs and be grateful they rise and fall on their own. That your heart is beating strongly in your chest without assistance. Call the people you love. Get in a car and drive to their doorstep and remind them how much you love them. We are not here to waste time not living, breathing, moving, loving. We are not just here to work, eat, sleep, make money and spend money. We are here to love. Please go outside right now and look at the mountains. Use your phone to extend some love instead of emails. It's not a request today. It's a plea. Do not wait to die to begin to live. We have special people in our lives. We cannot continue quarreling with them and walking around in unforgiveness. It makes us bitter. So love the people in your life if it's true that we're going to die. And secondly, live your life to the best of your ability. Steve Jobs, when he was 17 years old, found a quote that says, Live every day as if it is your last because one day you might just be right. And then he went on and every morning he said he would look himself in the mirror and say to himself, Steve, if today was your last day, would you do what you're about to be doing today? And that really questions um, how we live our lives. I mean, are you really living your dream? Are you really living out what you've been created for? Are you living out your full talents? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Life is not about just, you know, going to school for 18 years, studying for five years, working for 45 years, a job that you despise so that you can retire for 10 years. What if you die just before you retire? It's ridiculous. We've all been designed with a purpose and a design to do something impactful and powerful in this world. God has placed us here for a purpose to fulfill a purpose. I think it was Mark Twain that said the two most important days in your life is the day that you are born and the day that you find out why. We've been placed here for a purpose and we've really got to evaluate what we are busy doing with our lives. And we've got to give our best at what we are doing. And thirdly, if it's true that we're going to die, then I think it is only a rational statement to say that we need to do, or that we need to find out where it is that we're going after we die before we die. And that brings in the question of religion. And this is usually where the people at the funeral start getting a little bit uh, fidgety because it's uncomfortable. Yet it is a rational question. It is a fact that we're going to die. So obviously any rational person would try and at least figure out what's going to happen after they die before they die. I think that's a very good question to ask yourself. Now, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in him because he's the only one that solves the issue of death. He's the only one that didn't stay dead. No founder of any other religion has died for the people. And no founder of any other religion is living. Every year, millions of people go to uh, the Middle East to go walk around the grave and to go visit the grave of Muhammad. And if anybody would allow them, they could dig into that rock and they could go and touch the bones of Muhammad, the founder of the Islamic religion. The tooth of Buddha is being preserved in India. You can go and touch it in one of the museums over there. But Jesus, millions of people go every year to Jerusalem. You know what they go look at? They go look at an empty grave. You can go search north, south, east, west of the whole planet. You will not find the body of Jesus. Why? Because he's risen. God came to the earth. He died. He was risen to life so that we can have life. That's why I believe in Jesus. He's the only one that solves the issue of death. And he said, if you believe in me, you will live even though you die. 
The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus came to take away our fear of death. The biggest problem the human race has is death. And the only faith that answers that question is Christianity. That's why I'm a Christian. Let's look at the third point just briefly. Mourning is better than feasting or, or sad face is good for the heart. And I think that is true. You see, it's when we're down in the valley, down in the valley where things are tough, where you've lost someone, where you really reflect on life. That's that's down in the valley. That's where the fruit trees grow and the, the rivers flow. And that's where the nutrition is. And so you eat when you're in a difficult situation. You eat well. Your soul is nourished. Even though you cry, it makes your heart strong. They say that when you, I think it was St. Augustine that said that when you cry, your heart is bleeding. It hurts. And thank goodness it hurts when you lose someone because it means that you did love. It's good to be in those morning moments because it makes you reflect on life. It makes your soul stronger. It lifts you up for what lies ahead. It gives you strength. If we just go around every day just laughing everywhere we go, that doesn't strengthen you. When you're on top of the mountain and you can see a great view, it's wonderful to be there, wonderful to see it. The great view and the fresh air, but there's no rivers flowing there. There's no fruit trees growing there. There's no nutrition. It's just great. It's down in the valley that we grow. It's down in the valley where we need God the most. If you've lost someone, then I would say to you, the earth is turning. Soak up that difficult moment that you find yourself in down in the valley. Soak it up. Eat as much as you can. Mourn your mourn. Cry it out. Tears are poison. If you don't let that liquid come out of your eyes, it's going to get stuck in your heart and it's going to make you bitter and angry and depressed. If you've lost someone you haven't cried about it, it's time to go cry about it, to go close to the, the door, the bedroom door. Go inside and go pray to God and cry out your heart to Him. Let Him cleanse you from the inside out. There are more important things in life, ladies and gentlemen, than making money. I'm going to read to you just an article of Steve Jobs on his deathbed. Apparently, this is something that he said. We are not 100% sure whether this was penned by him, but many people do think. So let me read this to you in, in closing. I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. In others' eyes, my life is an epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy. In the end, wealth is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to. At this moment, lying on the sick bed and recalling my whole life, I realize that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and became insignificant, uh, meaningless in the face of my impending death. In the darkness, I look at the green lights from the life-supporting machines and hear the humming mechanical sounds. I can feel the breath of, God, of the God of death drawing closer. Now I know when we have accumulated sufficient wealth to last our lifetime, we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. It should be something that is more important, perhaps relationships, perhaps art, perhaps a dream from your younger days. Non-stop pursuing of wealth will only turn a person into a twisted being just like me. God gave us the senses to let us feel the love in everyone's heart, not the illusions brought about by wealth. The wealth I have won in my life I cannot bring with me. What I can bring is only the memories precipitated by love. That's the true riches which will follow you, accompany you, giving you strength and light to go on. Love can travel a thousand miles. Life has no limit. Go where you want to go. Reach the height you want to reach. It is all in your heart and in your hands. What is the most expensive bed in the world? The sick bed. You can employ someone to drive the car for you, make money for you, but you cannot have someone to bear the sickness for you. Material things lost can be found, but there's one thing that can never be found when it is lost. Life. When a person goes into the operating room, he will realize that there is one book that he has yet to finish reading, the book of healthy life. Whichever stage in life we are right now, with time we will face the day when the curtain comes down. Treasure love for your family. Love for your spouse. Love for your friends. Treat yourself well and cherish others. A lady worked for five years with people, oh, not with, for five years, for many years, with people that have died and she worked with them in their dying moments and she wrote a book in which she describes the most common regrets that she's heard people express to her in their dying moments i want to share those five with you and challenge you to go and think about that the first one is this i wish i had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life that others expected of me 
Secondly, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. You see, there's a thing in this world that says you gotta you got to work yourself into a pulp. Forget about enjoying life. One day you're going to enjoy life. But what if you die before you start enjoying it? Number three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. I want to challenge you to put a smile on your face right now. And if you don't know Christ, I really want to invite you to get to know him better and take responsibility for that day where this life will end for us. Make the most of your life. Go love the person you love today. Send that text message. Make right with that person. Reflect on your life decisions, where you are going, the trajectory of your job, the ladder that you're climbing. Is that really what you want to do with your life? Think carefully about where you're going when you die. Do you trust that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Think carefully. I thank you for this time. Thank you that you listened to this. And I hope that in some way or another, this will inspire you to take your life to the next level. Love you all. Have a super week.